Okay. Hello. <laughs> hey, I'm the guy introducing you, Nick. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hey, uh, this is Dr. Mulder and my co-host, your kid. Liz. Dr. Liz. Dr. Liz. Yes, uh, today we have a special guest who just so happens to be one of my best friends. I've known this gentleman for over, what? how long do you think, about 23, 24 years, something like yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, a long time. Uh, we both uh, have uh, worked on uh, patents together, and uh, he's one of those guys that we, I would talk to like a, maybe three or four o'clock in the morning about, you know, quantum computers. Uh, we'd talk about, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff, holographic universes. Uh, all, I mean, the, the list goes on and on. But uh, I wanted to bring him in tonight and kind of get his insights on a couple of things here. And, uh, and so we might as well get the show rolling here. Oh, first off, uh, by the way, uh, Liz, I want to, uh, uh, I'm going to go into this on, uh, on our next show here, I think probably on Sunday, uh, about uh, what you and I worked on the other day concerning that uh, insurance company. And the results was absolutely fantastic. I just want to give you a... a Great big uh, thumbs up and a hats off and a gold star and a smiley face. Oh, I like the smiley face. That's nice. I'll take the right. gold star. Okay, fantastic. All right, well, let's go ahead and get this thing going here. All right, Nick, or, uh, go ahead and intro uh, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your background and what, you know, what you've been doing here for the last, uh, I don't know, 50 or 60 years of your, on this planet. Oh, yeah. Well, my name's Nick Atchison, and I am... Uh, basically from North Dakota, uh, from a family of, you know, people from North Dakota, kind of like quasi North Dakota cowboy. And uh, then I went to uh, California and grew up in California and went to the educational system there and went to the University of California and where I graduated with a degree in comparative systems theory which is an interdisciplinary degree having to do with uh, how the mind works and uh, how computers work and what's the relationship between the two. And early on, I got involved in holography. And because of that, I got involved in microphotolithography. And then that I had various jobs as a computer programmer while I was in school and also as a laboratory animal. And so I ended up working in the semiconductor industry, doing programming and QA, chemical synthesis. My background is actually in chemistry, uh, early part of it. And then I uh, uh, began producing inventions, and I can do that. And that's one of the things I've, I, I do a lot is for some reason I can pop up with innovations. And so what I did on my thesis was I took a bunch of interdisciplinary classes and laced them together so that at the end of the whole thing, I had an 800 page book with three to eight footnotes per sentence uh, discussing how uh, the brain worked and how it shows up in the way civilization is limited. And what happens with that, though, that's kind of interesting, is in the 1970s, the astronomers were working. And while I was learning how to compute from the computer, there's a computer program that taught me how to program called this. And I was talking to the professors, and they had a, a, a program where they were trying to figure out why the galaxies look the way they do. And so the program would model the interactions of the galaxies and the way they stretched each other out and caused each other to have arms and stuff and spirals. And, uh, so that was the beginning of a whole new reality. And that reality of the simulation that figures itself out until it kind of matches reality. You see like the way a guided missile comes in on the, on the flame of a jet by heat these programs will home in on reality. And so that's the new super truth. And so what's very, very interesting is my, I used that in generating my, my, my thesis. I was a programmer at the university at the time 
working for the university extension and writing these. And so I ended up putting some time in on that. And um, so the actual thesis is like, there's five models that can explain something. And my thesis is just one that was most extensive. And I got honors on that by Gregory Bateson, who was one of the founders of systems theory. And he like invented the double blind scary theory of schizophrenia and stuff like that. And he was married to Margaret Mead and he was a big anthropologist. And he's a nice guy. But the thing is, what came out of that is I could type. And so I went back to the semiconductor industry to get a job. And uh, because I could type, they had me rewrite the specifications as they keep the wafer size keeps getting bigger. And I was working on doing that and programming and doing and writing the the uh, specifications, but I write them as programs. So I ended up two or three years after I was there being the engineering manager of a startup in Algeria because I had memorized the specs. And, uh, you know, it's kind of weird. But then I came back from that and I got all involved in... Uh, design. I worked as a process, product, and test, and uh, mask-making engineer, and assembly engineer. And I began working in design, doing the designs of analog and digital devices, improving new designs that, that use these logic modules called 7400 series parts. And it's actually LS7400. And those are like computers are built. And so I worked my way on through the years to where I was doing really big, complicated mathematical analysis programs, but I kind of know the whole thing from the root. So it, it, it doesn't, it's like if you speak 10 languages, most people just need to speak one. So it's kind of useless, but it's kind of neat for me, you know, but, uh, and so that's who I am. Oh, okay. Oh, well, that, I'm, I'm glad you were able to uh, narrow that down to 25 words or less. That was great. Right. <laughs> okay. But, uh, yeah, um, you know, some of the things that I kind of wanted to cover tonight while you were on the air uh, was, uh, number one, I think you and I have spent numerous hours talking about the holographic universe, and I think that kind of tied into the Mandela effect, which I'm, I, I just have this, I don't know what it is, uh, just something about the Mandela effect just seems to resonate with me because it's, it, it kind of coincides with, with what I feel is uh, basically a, a universe that's fluid and is constantly changing, both in the future, the present, and the past. And uh, would you like to make any comments uh, concerning you know, your ideas of a holographic universe? Okay. Well, basically, what we call the universe that we think of actually started about 10,000 years ago. Uh, the real universe started... 14 billion years ago or something, mm -hmm. uh, the beginning of the Big Bang. But the human mind showed up as a camera thinking about it about 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago. And maybe 30, 15,000 years ago, they were painting in caves. Mm -hmm. This animal showed up thinking about this, running around. And so, but as they went through the sequence of events of turning into who we are today, there were like hinges. And they're like an axis and worlds rotate on axis. Cultures and minds and civilizations have an axis. And they'll, but the big thing going on today is we have this thing where we now, well, let's just say starting in about uh, 1500, they began to develop a more, uh, realistic depiction of the way things work. The Sumerians actually had a really good one, almost uh, 4,000, oh, uh, 7,000, 5,000 years ago. And, but they had really good science. They had good calculus and they had good astronomy. And then it kind of went down for a while, but then it came back by 1850. And, uh, but starting in 1800, 1700, uh, Ben Franklin and those guys doing their research and <clears throat> he's making the first light bulb in 1800 and then Michael Faraday doing 
Well, they began working on all these things and machines, and they began making formulas and drawings and stuff. And there was a difference between whether the drawing was the machine or the formulas were the machine or what. But about the time Einstein uh, let loose in 1903, I guess, uh, it became obvious that the formulas were the universe. And along with that, at that time, radionics kicked in. And, uh, and so it, it's like Einstein and uh, Tesla and those guys were coming up with these new ideas. But in all cases, guys like Columbus even had an idea of doing something that then he proved by doing it. Same thing Einstein did, you know, same thing Tesla did and same thing that, you know, Babbage did with the computer. But we keep having these things where we're trying to. And so now they're, you know, Einstein came up with the idea that light could change into energy and be a particle and like that. And so that was the beginning of he was actually the beginning of quantum mechanics. And now we know that there's a whole other, there's the electromag, there's the mechanical, then there's the chemical, then there's the electrical, electromagnetic. Now there's the quantum uh, dimensions almost. But for some reason, just like DC flows real slow through wire, AC flows a lot faster, radio flows like speed of light. Mm -hmm. And quantum holographic data is transmitted instantaneously throughout the universe. They know that. But exactly where we're at on that is like where Ben Franklin was. I mean, they're, they're beginning to build a quantum computer now. The Google quantum computer in 200 seconds solved a problem that Summit, which is the biggest computer on Earth, I guess, and it's the biggest one we have in the United States, it's as big as a football field. It would take it some like 20 or thousands of years. It's a really long time. You know, it's, it's like, but the difference in that is that today we're dealing with quantum. And for some reason, it's, it's always very difficult because prior to what I call super truth that started in the 70s, it's like those hurricane maps of the hurricane. That's super truth. And they say it could be any one of these models. That's super duper truth because they're actually comparing the models and, and working on what it is. But the, the model is the new super truth. And the point is that in the old days, people would argue about being Catholic or Protestant or Muslim. And that's just argument like in a court. It's just arguing or in a debate society. It has very little bit to do with super truth. And super truth has to do with the fact that you can actually describe what happens, how it happens. And things that are a description of what happens in the human mind is, I mean, that's like, a, a, we're just a computers full of bugs, really, you know? Mm -hmm. and, so, so quantum computers. Sorry, Nick. I just this is Liz. I just um, I need to jump in because I'm easily getting slowly getting lost here. But um, I think for a lot of our listeners who um, who may be uh, wondering what you're talking about, <laughs> can you go back to ten thousand to twenty thousand years ago? What do you mean by the fact that humans were basically cameras? What do you mean by that? Well, yeah, I used to work in a company that made cameras, and because of my background studying minds and simulating them, and you know having them. Uh, you know, they're tradition directed, inner directed, other directed mind, different styles of how minds work. I looked at that camera and I thought, wow, that's a mind. You know, an electronic camera is has all the parts. It's not conscious, but it, it's got all the parts of a mind. It's got a memory, it's got an eye, it's got sensors, you know, and now they have radio, they can do all this stuff. So the human brain is like a camera. But the thing is that because we don't know what that camera does, it obviously takes, it can think and smell and feel and take pictures, but it can also do other things that it can, it can prophesy and be accurate. It can see into the future. 
And now experiments have shown that the earlier ideas that the math showed that time travel can happen, you know, uh, uh, Maxwell's basic equations that he derived from uh, Michael Faraday's work and other work uh, showed that there's no thing to stop time from slipping around. And then now uh, some experiments have been done in big universities back east showing that there really is a fact that human beings aren't necessarily locked in this space time. And there's certain chemicals and certain things like uh, photons that'll get tied together. And it's called uh, entanglement. And you'll have one, you'll polarize one entangled photon here and maybe somewhere far, far away instantaneously will replicate what you did to the one here. And with no energy transmission in between. It's kind of weird. But so that brain that evolved around 10,000 or 20,000, whatever, you know, uh, the people came up out of Africa about, eh, they say, 300 to 70,000 years ago. And some of them went over and parked by where uh, Kuwait is now and became the Sumerians. And there were the Egyptians and all these other people. But the Sumerians were like cameras that could figure out what they were looking at, kind of on the order of what a Tesla car can do. I mean, I have a computer that is a little bored, and it's called the Jetson. And it looks out the camera, and it goes, turkey, dog, bicycle, like that. Well, that's what these – now, the monkeys and the chimpanzees, they can actually do quite well. You know, they can, they can teach them how to uh, converse in sign language and stuff like that. And they express themselves quite well. And, but they didn't do it on their own. The ones at 10,000 BC spontaneously started expressing themselves and saying, Saturn has rings. And doing things to figure that out. And, and that's what I'm getting at. Now, in that progression of, like, say, from, yeah, you know, it could be as far back as 7,000 BC up to now. It's a progression of events, like the, where one decoding leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And we're just like when a chiropractor cracks your back, it goes click, 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 click. Well, we are in the process of figuring out the universe. And if nothing screws us up like a meteor, we will. And we're already getting ready to engineer our own DNA. And so it's like, ooh, you know, my aunt, Edna, said, Naked Joe, you're the kind of kid that would take his brain out and play with it if he could. Well, here we are. I mean, you know, it's, it's like this is what's happening. Now. Does that answer the question? Hello, Liz. Hello, Liz. Hey there. Liz. Yeah, no, I'm here. Yeah, sorry. I was just going to say, Nick, thank you. I was going to ask, and then if you can explain what super truth is, then I'll be all caught up. Okay, well, super truth, uh, truth is, you know, before, you know, like, you know, 1500. Truth in different places of the world was different depending upon where you were born. Just like what language you learned to speak, you learned the local truth. And so truth, like what we think of as add, subtract, multiply, and divide, that's different. That's not truth. That's the way it is. Truth is an opinion, like debating and lawyers and all that. They're figuring out what's true, normal truth. Like when, the, when you're convicted of murder falsely, you know, and all that stuff, that's a fact. You say that's true, he did it. You know, he, you know, that kind of truth. But super truth is when a computer can say, not only can I predict the past, I can predict the future. I know that we can shoot a, a rocket off here and I can predict 
that I can fly it by and rotate it at the right speed to keep keep the camera pointed at Pluto. That's true. If you can do something, but if it's but it's like hands off. It has to be in a machine where the machine can do it. Then you can say that's super true. You know, and if the machines are arguing about what way to do it, that's even better. But the thing is, to be able to predict what happened and what's going to happen. So we can't predict at all with any great reliability about what's happening and what's what happened and what's going to happen. So there is no truth in terms of that, no super truth. But everybody says, oh, yeah, this is true and that's true. And he is a so-and-so and she's a this and a that. Those are things that are true. Like, you can even say it's a true thing that uh, so-and-so ate a strawberry ice cream. But not really. You can't even say that. Not, not after this Mandela effect. I mean, you know, you may think he did. Or when, you know, when, the, when these people that, if you got it on tape, then you can say that's probably true. But if you have a computer programmer program that'll imitate it and will replicate what the guy did when he got up for morning and ate for breakfast and what he did all day long and what all these guys did and just show exactly how all those electrons were scattering around and what events happened, that's super true. Got it. Thanks. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, and so we don't have much super truth, but we got it. But mm -hmm. when did super truth happen? 1970. You know, I mean, there were inklings of it, you know, like Einstein. He said, the universe is rubber. And, you know, but you realize that after Evie did that in 1903, and in Germany, before World War II and even after World War you know, up to the end of World War II, they were teaching that what he said wasn't true. But the computers say it's true. They can wow. predict the way the photons warp around the sun and all that stuff. So that's just one, one little snippet of truth that he did that experiment and he showed that he knew, you know, and like when Mendel made the periodic table of elements and he had all the different elements stacked up, looked like Swiss cheese. But he, people were able to predict where they were going to find a new element. So that's uh, early super truth. But Mendel was acting like a computer when he did that. And as a senior staff engineer, I can tell you that when I'm doing my best work as an engineer, I'm acting like a machine. I'm writing computer programs and I'm doing evaluations, doing descent algorithms like a river going to the ocean mm -hmm. and different algorithms like that and using different statistical methods to, I act like the machine. I'm not acting like a human. When I'm inventing and I'm, and I'm creating or writing poems or something, then I'm being like shamanic prophetic. That's a different part of the brain. Computers can't do that yet. Hmm. You, uh, you know, it's like beyond any shadow of a doubt, they've done experiments that show people are precognitive. And you know, get all these people poo-pooing and say, oh no, no, it doesn't work. Well, there are books published where the guy did the experiment and now there's certain People saying, yeah, the experiments that were done back east by this professor are right. But there are still people poo-pooing it just the way the German uh, in Germany poo-pooed Einstein. Mm -hmm. Because they didn't like him, you know, because yeah. he was Jewish. Yeah. But so the point is, so in fact, in terms of like quantum reality and what quantum is, 
we can say we honestly don't know. But it sure looks like there's another continent over there. And if we just sail that way, we'll hit it. And the only way you will ever know is you need to get a sailboat and do it. And if you want to find out about radionics, get a box and try it. Mm. You know, it's that simple. Yeah. And you, I mean, I myself, senior staff engineer, probably more educated and more experienced than a lot. You find trouble finding them. They don't even spec them because there's so few, you know, that, and I've got patents and all this stuff. And it's Nikki Joe Atchison. You can check it out, you know, but, and I've written books and you can see all that on the, on, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn and YouTube, but I'm telling you as a high level dude, radionics works. And it works for me. It may not work for you, but I had a house I put up for sale. I inherited my mother's house and I put it up for sale and I got an extra 250,000 bucks because I dialed in a box, but it may have just been self hypnotism or self motivation or like affirmations, but I don't really care because I got it in my wallet. Yeah, that's a super so, truth. <laughs> you know. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, I don't, you know, it's, yeah. yeah. I, you know, like I said, Nick, one of the greatest compliments you ever gave me was that the day you got that machine that I sent you uh, was the day that your life started to change forever. You you were never the same person. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, when it first came in the mail, I just put it on the buffet. You know, I was taking care of my mother. And I set it to help me take care of her. Well, no, first I would just set it there and things started to kind of get smoother. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe it's just my attitude. Maybe it's like taking Thorazine or something or, you know, uppers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was like, it was like things got better, nicer. <clears throat> and then I know I ran some tests and so I study languages. So uh, I, for the, over the next year or so, I studied simultaneously Chinese and Japanese on those CDs, learned whatever in your car. I did the whole set to probably like 90, 95% of capability. That's 5,000 words or so each, Chinese and Japanese. Normally that would take eight years, more than that. And I just, my brain just zip and it's like when you're really interested in something and you're really on and clear and not, you know, doing a distraction when you can really focus on what you're doing and not worrying about and being embarrassed about, Oh, it's fun to say that in Chinese. Well, you just learn. And the, the same thing is true for, Working on really complicated problems like learning how to hook my computers up through the router, which is kind of a painful thing because it got to be done just right. Well, you know, I just went ahead and did it. And so I kind of go ahead and do things. And but my mother lived to be 103. And, you know, and I stayed there in the house and took care of her cook for her and everything. And I was a, like a, I was a medic in the army. I was more like a physician's assistant. In fact, in a lot of situations, I was the physician for, you know, but you, these guys aren't sick. They, you know, in the United States, by and large, nobody dies before 60. And most people in the army, they're very healthy. And, but they would get colds and clap. And so I could handle that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I can imagine that is there. There's a lot of truth to that statement. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, what I was really there for was hangover. I made a great poultice for hangover. I had oh. a little thing of pills I made up 
that was for Hangover, and it worked like a champ. Oh, oh, geez. Well, so so Liz, have you got any questions for uh, Nick here? Oh, well, I was going to ask Nick, how do you think radionics works? Uh, well, I can I can tell you that it's holographic, and that when your brain, which has you know, it's entanglement. It works. I think entanglement is an important part of it. And when the universe went off, there were a lot of simultaneously created photons. And you are a mass of all these particles that are from then, you know, every part of you was born in the Big Bang. So we're kind of all together on this. You know, we're all the same, you know. But how do they say it? Chip off the old block. But the thing is, in your brain, there are various chemicals, and they think some of them are entangled. But obviously, they if they haven't found them yet, or they'll find something. But when you tune the box, you know, that's the thing that's wild, is first off, there's a low-level effects of self-hypnotism. I self-hypnotized myself to learn Chinese. Ni hao, you know, and all that. And I, uh, but then there's the other thing where uh, when I meditate, you know, um, I will meditate with a box and I will fly throughout the universe. Kind of like astral project, but just more like daydream, you know, not actually doing it. But you don't know. I mean, and so, uh, you know, if you sit and meditate with the box on your chest and recliner, dial the knobs and just go, you know, and there's this thing of 10,000 Chinese singing the hymn to joy. Have you ever heard that? No. Oh, it's fabulous. It's the biggest group of people. You know, they sing... Da, 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 you know, hymns of joy. You know, but anyway, and so I think of that when I'm meditating. And, I'll, you know, I have ways of doing it. But the point is, uh, and then I take off and fly through the universe. And I sing at the universe. And I feel really good. But the thing is, whether or not they're out there listening, I don't know. But it, it makes it charges your brain is these billions of neurons right and they're all doing what they're doing and as you learn more and more languages they kind of comb themselves out and they get good at it but the more that you resonate with the universe you comb out your brain and your attitude about yourself i think of myself as a self-tuning guitar and that's really the way the brain works is it's more like resonating and you know like the, the guitar strings they're stretching those are electronic bonds that are going under different tensions it's almost like you know an elastic rubber band is a quantum thing you know but it's the tension on the bonds right but and so what i'm saying though is when when you try to go inside yourself to the simplest thing that you are and resonate with the basic simple thing of the universe it's like when you have an old image orthicon camera you they get the they get to where they store shadows and stuff and so they'll point them at a white piece of paper to clean up the tube you know and really expensive old cameras they used to have to do that and that's kind of like what you do when you meditate like you know bodhi dharma dharma uh would stare at a white wall and just kind of clean out the circuits. All the rest of the stuff that you're thinking about is predominantly bullshit. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so if you just stop and neutralize yourself and then go back to starting about your life again, doing your stuff, it's different. Things don't have the same effect. And if you do it with a box where you the thing about stick plate and you know if you did it with a lie detector 
But the thing about doing it with a stick plate and you say, you know, I'm going to tune into the universe now. And you, and your your body goes along with it. And you do it. I mean, wow. And, you know, it's a, it's a big thing. I have a, a book I wrote called, this, uh, you know, anyway. And it's about how to work on these like crossword puzzles to where you confound the whole brain and your own ability to think about things. It's like working on a big puzzle so you don't get bored, you know? Mm -hmm. And But in the process of learning that, you're fitting together all these basic Buddhist concepts that tell you to cool it. Well, that's important to do that, you know? I mean, you can see it on, I have an eBay, uh, I, I don't sell much. I, I don't, you know, I don't do that. But well, you can see it on eBay on Soco Chico. And Soco Chico, S-O-C-O-C-H-I-C-O, is my store. There's all kind of weird shit there. But, you know, I'm, I'm not interested in... But the point is, um, people who are on your show and listen to your stuff, if they send you a request, I can send them a copy of my thesis or something like that. You know, but the thesis is really wild because it was what it hypothesizes is that um, the brain is working like the immune system memory. And it is able to carry out logic functions. And I show how that kind of, a, of an analog, it's like the Havels, an analog, you know, mm -hmm. uh, heuristic analog logician. And in that kind of thing, how the brain works. But you don't have to know that. You don't have to know how a radionics box does. What you do is you, as soon as you get the radionics box, and you put your hand, the multiverse changes. You are now in a different multiverse. You know, I mean, suddenly you have all your power back. Because I agree with that. You I agree with that. Playing in a different movie. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, this is, like I said, Nick, this stuff always. You know, I think you and I have had many conversations about where I, you know, my uh, my hypothesis behind why these things works or the, uh, these machines work is, uh, you know, due to the uh, double slit experiment, the observation effect. And um, I wonder, I think what you're saying, in a, I think kind of ties into that very same thing. It's, it's the observer uh, is basically creating their own reality, their own universe. Would you yeah. agree? Sus the guy Suskin? You know, mm -hmm. call plumber, mm -hmm. uh, working on string theory and the multiverse and all that. Mm -hmm. well, how do you choose what multiverse you're going to live in? Well, yeah. you know, you take a box and put it on the table. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, that is a very big item in your reality. You mm -hmm. see what I mean? Oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, it's like the multiverse changes and suddenly you're able to hypnotize yourself and tell yourself like I do that I'm going to merge with the universe. And I got to tell you, you know, the, the unleashing the juices of creativity when mm -hmm. you, when you give yourself your power back, mm -hmm. it's amazing. Oh yeah. Because you can just, you don't have to listen to people saying that's not real. You mm -hmm. say, well, nothing's real. We yeah. live in a multiverse. You know, it's like, yeah. so it's as real as, you know. But on the other hand, people who try to get you to agree to live in their multiverse, mm -hmm. that's another question. I don't do that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. From the some of the conversations you and I have had, I would agree. I would agree. Yeah, we... I, I think we both, uh, you know, we walked to the, or the sound of a different drummer, you know, or, and, uh, but, uh, you know, it's very strange. How, how can, you know, you and I were talking about, for example, there, you know, we have basically two, two different uh, philosophies in this country and they're, and they're both in battle with each other. Okay. How can you have, uh, you know, basically the same 
you know, they're all human beings. They're all living on the same continent, the continent, and uh, and they're all under the same form of government. But they, but their, but their philosophy or their ideas about how that government should work is entirely, you know, 180 degrees out of face. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's really interesting. Which means it's not the kind of thing that's thought through to the base. You see uh, the term tectonic, like plate tectonics and the galactic tectonics, the way the galaxies interact. The machines can simulate that because they've thought it through as far as they can. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. most people are running on snippets. Mm -hmm. and, and because of snippets, I mean, you know, I mean, everybody was going along, being happy, being Catholic and doing their stuff. The printing press came out, and all of a sudden, people started reading and thinking for themselves. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And it started a big war that went on for 300 years. And, you know, and people in Scotland, way, you know, nowhere out in the woods, you know, mm -hmm. uh, get the idea that they had a certain thing they wanted. They, they had their particular snippet. And somebody else would say, no, you can't think like that. And so that's the really cool thing about the United States. I mean, all those people up and left Scotland and went to the United States, and, you know, they have had a lot to do with why we have freedom, mm -hmm. you know, as much as we do have, you know. But the thing is, uh, we are allowed to argue. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not considered to be bad to be on a different – I mean, it's it's – it's considered to be horrible to not be just like me. But the thing is, you, you, we have this kind of respect or whatever for you and your religion and whatever else you think. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, there's a general set of basic rules as far as allowing people to be okay that we go by. And a lot of countries, you know, you know the, the arisen... The United States was the first country, and that includes Switzerland, that got rid of the aristocracy. The illusion that some people were better than them because of their status in society. You can be better than somebody else if they're a screw up. You know what I mean? Right. Because they, but you can't be like, two little babies being born together, they're kind of the same. And if you mix them up at birth, you know, things happen. And there are genetic differences between people. But we haven't figured that out yet to where mm -hmm. we can classify people at birth, like mm -hmm. in Brave New World. No. But, uh, yeah. And so the point of the whole thing is, you, do, you know, as far as, the really big thing about bringing people back together is to blow off all the bullshit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just go down and focus on what's common in the universe, what's mm -hmm. common between us, and that's the universal will to exist, you know? That's mm -hmm. from, uh, that's from uh, uh, an author. You know, it's not mine. But we all have the universal will to exist. And we have the universal will to be alive and well. And that's cool. But mm. the, the, the big important thing is that, you know, I mean, it's like in my life, you go through and you do a lot of stuff. But the nicest things that happen are these family parties and dinners and festivals with mariachis and stuff. Things that are kind of human. That's yeah. the stuff that really counts. And, uh, you know, and sitting and having a, some of my, sitting and talking to my chums and, like, you know, talking to you about radionics. That's fun stuff. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to the, you know, the, the best things in life are free. I mean, you oh, can't yeah. put money on this. Anyway, no. yeah. So, Liz, I think you want to say something? Oh, I was just going to say, I feel like um, 
that that's what this is all about. That's the so what of all this. That's why you put a radionics box on your chest and tune into the universe. So you feel more happy, healthy, whole, and you can go have a beer in your backyard with your people. And I love that. And I was just going to interrupt and ask you, gentlemen, do you feel like we're at about the 45 minute mark? Would you guys like to stop and take a break or keep going? Um, it's entirely up to you, Nick. I'm, I'm, yeah, we're probably been on here. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a unit and we can put this, yeah, I'll take a break. Yeah, okay. Right. Uh, oh, it's okay. I guess uh, five minutes, we'll go ahead and uh, get back on Skype. Yeah, that's great. So this is, um, epi- this is part one of Nick Atchison. All right, everyone. 